Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is John Herbst. I run the Dinu Petruccio Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we've got a wonderful event for you today, an event we bring to you with the Central Asia and Caucasus Institute, our partners. And the CACI is part of the American Foreign Policy uh, Group. Uh, Dick Hoagland is an old friend of mine. We worked together on and in Central Asia uh, back 15, 16 years ago. He, as you now know, is responsible for U.S. policy on Nagorno-Karabakh. And you have here um, bios, so I'm not going to read you Dick's bio, or for that matter, our distinguished panelist bios. Check it out. Uh, Dick will speak for a few minutes on the conflict as seen from Washington based on his uh, delving into the region. In fact, I, I last I ran at Dick last in a hotel in Tbilisi where he was on, 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 the, on the job. And then we have, a, a, again, a distinguished panel, uh, a panel where we'll be talking a little bit about the book that came out from CACI, The International Politics of the Armenian-Azerbaijani Conflict. And with that, Dick, over to you. OK, thanks very much, John. Uh, let me say what an honor it is to be invited back to the Atlantic Council, uh, this time to speak on Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, I want to emphasize up front that I am the interim co-chair, U.S. co-chair, for the Mintz Group process of the OSCE. That means I've been on the job since the beginning of January and will probably continue into the summer, but it's between two full-time co-chairs. Uh, the other co-chairs, of course, are Russia and France. And the three co-chairs have been at this for quite a long time, <laughs> about a quarter century. Now, although I speak to you today as the U.S. co-chair of the OSCE Mintz Group, I don't speak for my French and Russian colleagues. My message to you is simply a statement of U.S. official policy that guides our engagement as we help the sides, Armenia and Azerbaijan, to try to find an overdue solution to Nagorno-Karabakh and lasting peace for the region. In recent weeks, in fact, uh, I have traveled to Baku and Yerevan, where I had the opportunity to meet with President Saliyev and Sarksian, as well as Foreign Ministers Mahmoud Yarif and Nalbandian, whom the co-chairs meet on a pretty regular basis. And we're right now in the process of scheduling our next trip to the capitals, um, very likely June or early July, but we need to pin that down yet. Um, the co-chairs also traveled uh, in this most recent trip to Stepanakert, where we met with the de facto Nagorno-Karabakh representatives. In these meetings, I have listened to what all sides have to say, and I have to tell you, I've developed a renewed understanding of the intense complexities surrounding these negotiations. There's a body of principles, understandings, and documents already on the table that lay out a deal. And no one has suggested that anyone abandon all of those plans on the table. The challenge is to help the sides find the political will to take that last bold step forward to bridge their remaining differences and deliver the peace and stability that their populations deserve. For more than two decades, however, peace has been elusive. The sides distrust each other, and a generation of young people has grown up in Armenia and Azerbaijan with no first-hand contact with the other side. As many have noted, older generations remember a time when Armenians and Azerbaijanis lived side by side and differences did not need to be resolved through the barrel of a gun. The outlines of a comprehensive settlement are already well established. At the heart of the deal, are the UN Charter and relevant documents and the core principles of the Helsinki Final Act. In particular, we focus on those principles and commitments that pertain to the non-use or threat of force, territorial integrity, and equal rights and self-determination for peoples. 
The Mintz Group co-chairs constantly work to bring the sides together, to develop new approaches to the peace process, and to find ways to reduce tensions in the region. Progress, of course, depends on the good faith and political will of the sides. They're not there yet, but we haven't given up. They haven't given up. No one has given up. Everyone is still looking for that final elusive peace. The time has come again for the sides to commit themselves to good faith negotiations and prepare their populations for peace, building on the foundation of work done so far. It's not realistic to conclude that occasional meetings are sufficient by themselves to bring about a lasting peace. When the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan meet together, their conversations are substantive and deal with the key issues that need to be resolved. We would like to see the presidents get together again, and the sooner, the better. There's no substitute for face-to-face -face dialogue, and the co-chairs are prepared to facilitate that communication at any time in the future. When such top-level negotiations commence, the parties should not only reconfirm their commitment to the ceasefire, but also how they will implement the much-needed confidence-building measures agreed upon last year at meetings in Vienna and then in St. Petersburg. Once we get into such peace nego negotiations, there's a much broader range of practical issues that we can put on the table to begin to benefit all sides immediately. These include economic and commercial incentives to develop regional energy, transportation, and communications links to rebuild. They include travel and people-to-people -people programs that can begin to counter the dangerously one-sided narratives that currently prevail. We co-chairs of the Minsk Group share a common interest in helping the sides reach a peaceful resolution. We intend to continue working through the Minsk Group as the primary channel for resolving this conflict. Together with France, the United States and Russia share a common commitment to the peace and security in Nagorno-Karabakh. The United States remains ready to help in any way we can. But of course, it's up to the leaders and the governments of Armenia and Azerbaijan to take the truly concrete steps necessary for a lasting peace. They should consider measures, even unilateral ones, that will demonstrate their stated commitment to making progress, reducing tensions, and improving the atmosphere for negotiations. They should avoid hostile rhetoric and prepare their populations for peace, not war. Despite everything, I continue to be optimistic. So thank you very much. Dick, thank you for that um, concise outline of where our policy is today and putting it in context. I'd like to give Svante the first word on, on this to talk about sort of the broad implications of what's going on in the Gona Karabakh and what it means regionally and beyond. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to, to be here in our joint uh, series of um, uh, events on the region with the Atlantic Council. Uh, let me first say um, a few words about the... Um, the book and why we thought it was important to have a book exactly on the international politics of this conflict because there have been a lot of things written in the past 25 years if not before about about Nagorno-Karabakh and about Armenia and Azerbaijan and their conflict uh, but mm -hmm. very little in terms of a system systematic treatment of the international politics surrounding the conflict and my argument or the idea or the, the underlying notion is that uh, yes as Ambassador Hoagland says it's really up to the parties. On the other hand, uh, there is a lot happening affecting the parties over which they have 
very limited amounts of control, which is in the realm of the geopolitics of the Caucasus, which has become, uh, I think, very important for how this conflict evolves and certainly for the prospects for, for an eventual solution. Now, uh, of course, um, anybody following the conflict would know that there's been, since 2008, an almost linear escalation of uh, what previously was more or less uh, a stable ceasefire. It's not that there were not incidents before 2008, but since 2008 there's been an, a remarkable escalation, culminating, of course, in what we saw uh, in almost a little over a year ago, uh, what's now called the four-day war, where for the first time there was a, a more or less meaningful change in the line of control uh, in the conflict. Now, the, the escalation, of course, has local drivers. Uh, there is uh, a growing imbalance. There was, at least until the oil price crashed, but there is still, to, to some extent, a growing imbalance in the uh, economic and military power between the two parties. There is, of course, a hardening of positions after 25 years of conflict and you know, new generations being schooled in their various and very divergent uh, interpretations of history. Um, and I think this has led to different conclusions. Uh, on the Azerbaijani side, there is clearly a conclusion that passivity uh, equals the acceptance of the status quo in practice. And since you cannot live with the status quo, it means that you have to do something about it. Uh, the only way to get international attention is to ensure that the conflict is not forgotten. Uh, on the Armenian side, there is a conclusion that these changes that have <coughs> taken place require a change of doctrine, one that requires, if you will, de deterrence and preemption. Uh, and you can see how these two narratives are leading to uh, a growing escalation and an increasingly dangerous situation. Um, now, um, again, many people see this as, you know, wh why can't just the two parties come to a conclusion? Uh, uh, ten years ago, a French co-chair of the Minsk Group actually told me after a, present, a think tank event much like this in, in, in a European capital, that you can't really force a donkey to drink. That's the term he used. Uh, the implication being that, you know, if the two parties don't want to agree, there's really not that much we on the outside can do to change that. I would, of course, very much take issue with that definition of the problem and certainly of the role of the international community. Um, because I would argue that geopolitics was always present in this conflict from the very beginning. The role that Moscow, even in the late Soviet peri per uh, period, had in terms of manipulating what was going on on the ground. But I would argue that to, to a growing extent, the, uh, the geopolitical aspects have overridden many of the local drivers, uh, certainly today constituting the main obstacle perhaps to peace. Um, but also the conflict has become an instrument for foreign powers to achieve goals in the region that have more to do with each other than they have to do with the actual par primary parties to the conflict. And certainly uh, in the past five or six years, we've seen another dimension, which is uh, that the Caucasus has become increasingly interlinked with the geopolitics of the Middle East because the same powers that are, that, that are, the, main, um, that are the main forces determining what happens in Syria, uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, with the United States gradually disengaging. It's exactly the same situation as in the Caucasus, and therefore you have a kind of uh, overlapping or, or uh, developments in these two theaters, if you will, interacting with one another. Now, in this light, of course, the role of Russia is paramount. That will come as a surprise to nobody. Uh, and I think not least because we've seen how frozen, so-called frozen conflicts have been manipulated and actually, frankly, in the case of Ukraine, created uh, in order to further Moscow's geopolitical interests to prevent Western, as they would see it, encroachment in the former Soviet Union, to undermine the sovereignty and statehood of the countries in, this, in these regions, and to facilitate Russian influence and, and control over these countries. Uh, the question then is, have Western leaders connected the dots? And I would argue that the answer is no. After Russia invaded Georgia, Western powers gladly accepted the Russian offer to take the lead in mediating the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, as if these things were somehow not connected. And even after what happened in Ukraine, uh, Mr. Hoagland's predecessor continued to repeat what I consider the patently absurd notion that Russian and and American interests align in this conflict, uh, while Russia was selling record arm amounts of arms to both parties. So if the US sees eye to eye with Russia, that would implicitly mean that the US thinks it's a good idea to continue to arm both sides of the conflict, which I would uh, propose that it is not. Uh, if you look at Europe, um, you find that the EU has a policy, and we, I talk about this extensively in, in, in a chapter in 
to this book that, that essentially says that we're very much willing to help you after you reach a solution. But we're not going to lift a finger to make sure that you actually achieve the solution. That's not, also not very constructive. Now, uh, this whole thing could be ignored, if you will, if this was a faraway conflict that was you know, uh, not um, uh, affecting uh, the interests of, uh, of the US or, or, or its Western allies. Uh, and if the consequences, humanitarian consequences of ignoring the conflict wouldn't be potentially so dire. Uh, if you look in a long durée type at the future of this conflict, I would argue that this is something that we've seen before. Uh, this is the India-Kashmir, India-Pakistan conflict over Kashmir, or the Israel-Palestinian conflict, which, by which I mean something that does not remain <laughs> stable only because it is quote-unquote frozen. Uh, warfare re-erupts. April 2016 was like, if you will, a Cargill or a South Lebanon uh, instance. Uh, we've not yet had a major resumption of war like, say, the 1965 Indo-Pakistan conflict, the 1967 or 73 conflicts in the Middle East. But rest assured, we will if nothing is done to, uh, to mitigate uh, this escalation. Uh, the United States, of course, has clear interests here because by geography, the South Caucasus is important, if nothing else, because of its neighbors. Uh, there are two hostile powers to the United States and a NATO ally that is increasingly uncertain. Um, these are three small countries that are positive towards a growing American presence, if it is credible, which in the recent past it has not been, which is why you've seen increasingly more or less uh, uh, a careful attitude, uh, a cautious attitude from, from, all, from the countries in the region to the American presence. It is also, uh, of course, the only land and air corridor that connects NATO territory with the heart of the Eurasian continent. 9-11 <laughs> taught us the value of this land and air corridor. Uh, can we really assume we won't ever need that again? I would say no. So the only thing that could really help at this point is a restoration of America's uh, role. And I'm, by this I mean not only a role in the negotiation process, uh, but, uh, but a role in the strategic and geopolitical affairs of, of the region as a whole. It is really not only about America's role in the negotiations, it's about a reassertion, I would argue, of America's interests in the region. Uh, and certainly its engagement in the security affairs, of which, of course, the conflict is a major, is a major part. That, of course, means uh, taking the negotiation process seriously, which I, argue, I would argue has not been the case so far, uh, at least in the recent past. Uh, we cannot really let uh, the uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict be the playground for Sergei Lavrov. Thank you. Svante, thank you. That was a comprehensive look at the problem. Now, Brenda, you've done a chapter on Iran, so you can talk about how Iran relates to this and the other powers in the region as well. So yeah, I think studying Iran's <coughs> policy towards the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is very illustrative, not only as it pertains to the conflict, but also to understand Iran itself. Because we tend to think of, you know, if you look at um, the view of Washington on Iran, you see it as something that's really motivated by ideology. And, and where do we always hear this dichotomy of the Middle East being about Sunni versus Shiite states? Uh, President Obama used to tell us that we need to make room for the, for the Shiite power in, in, in the Middle East. But when you see um, when, when Iran relates to things that are far <coughs> away from its borders, like, like Lebanon, like Palestine, Israel, you may see something that you could interpret as very ideological, because these incidences don't have spillover into Iran itself. But when you look at Iranian foreign policy towards conflicts or, 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 or in general towards actors that border Iran, you see a completely different uh, foreign policy. And so therefore, for instance, you have nominally Christian populated Armenia in a, in a war with Sh Shiite majority Azerbaijan. And, uh, the, and, and at best, you could say Iran is neutral and or at certain periods is even, even supportive of Armenia in this conflict and never talks in Iranian rhetoric about, um, about refugee situations, about, about um, you know, if, if you compare their rhetoric towards uh, the Palestinian refugees from 60 to 70 years ago versus the Azerbaijani Shiite refugees today, you don't see you know, any, any form of uh, comparison. And we see this not only in terms of the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, but for instance, um, uh, Iran's policies on the Chechen conflict. Again, it can easily make the case from the, you know, the same Islamic solidarity argument that you know, after Russia and a number two to three intensive battles were really 
hundreds of thousands of Chechens were, were killed over, over a decade, you can make the argument that if they had Islamic solidarity, this would have played into its relations with Russia, but exactly nothing. Or the same in Tajikistan in the early 90s, when, when Iran really had a pretty good foothold there. And the minute Moscow told them that to stay out of Central Asia, suddenly you see a really pulling back of Iranians' policy. So you see that when Iran is in its close borders, where there could be spillover into its domestic arena, where it could affect its border security, um, you see that Iran's policy is completely pragmatic, nothing you know, of an Islamic Islamic element, and they save that for, for abroad, where, where it's less costly. So in the case of, you know, and, and what's, what's the motivation with, with the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict? I mean, one, um, this isn't a faraway conflict. Iran borders uh, the, these two countries, and in fact, you know, major refugee flows came into, in the 1990s in, in, into, into North Iran. And probably the most predominant mm -hmm. issue that affects Iran's policy towards Azerbaijan, Armenia, but also all its neighbors, is the fact that Iran is a multi-ethnic state. About 50% of the population of Iran is non uh, non-Persian, so that's the largest ethnic minority is Azerbaijani. <laughs> After that, it's, um, it's the Kurds and Arabs and Baluch and Turkmen. And while it's not covered so much in the Western media, I think there's a huge uh, element in, in Iranian, both domestic and, and foreign policy. Uh, we saw this in, uh, two months ago during, uh, during uh, the Akwaz demonstrations, um, Iranian, Iranian Arabs, that, that it, it brought to a situation you know, where, where uh, uh, basically the demonstrations led to even the oil production in this region uh, going down for a certain, certain period of, of time. So I think it's definitely in Tehran's considerations when you have not only 50% of the population ethnic minorities, but um, all of them concentrated in border areas, uh, um, Azerbaijan next to the Azerbaijani minority in Iran, Turkmenistan next to Mashhad, next to the head of the, the Turkmen community, the same with Kurds. And so you see that this factor, um, you know, definitely, uh, a, it, it's the determining factor in Tehran's policies uh, uh, towards this conflict. Thank you very much. Steve, I know you um, have something to say about Russia and its role here and also American policy. Yes, thanks, John. It's a great privilege to speak here today. Um, and uh, my remarks derive from the chapter in the book that I wrote about U.S. policy. I've been writing about the Caucasus for a long time. And already 20 years ago, I made the point that what happens in the Caucasus is of the utmost importance for Europe and by extension to the United States. I'm not alone in saying this. Robert Legvold said the same thing 20 years ago as well. And, uh, that should give you some sense of the strategic importance of this region, both for the United States and Europe on the one hand, and for Russia on the other. For Russia, it is of the utmost importance that the Caucasus independence de facto be suborned. It is the only way Russia can be a great power in the Black Sea area and project power into the Middle East, which it has wanted to do for a long time before 2015, and now is doing so. This conflict offers Russia the opportunity and has offered Russia the opportunity to move very far in support of that objective. Furthermore, as we saw in 2008, when Russia launched a war of aggression against Georgia, the implications of that war, the repercussions, do not stay in the Caucasus. They affected international relations all over the globe, particularly insofar as Europe and the Black Sea area are concerned. So resolution of this conflict, before it explodes again, I would argue, is of very great importance, not just for the United States, not just for Europe, but and obviously for the governments of Armenia and Azerbaijan, as well as for Turkey and for Russia. The danger today is growing. As Svante has pointed out, the implications of the latest round of fighting last year are not going to be contained in the Caucasus. Moreover, we have seen some very reckless arms racing by both sides and by Russia here. Azerbaijan has bought about $4 billion worth of weapons from Russia. It's also bought a lot of weapons from Israel and other th th third party sources. Armenia has bought an equivalent amount of money, uh, of weapons, excuse me, from Russia, often at cut rate prices. And since Azerbaijan pays full price, you have the uh, bizarre situation where essentially Azerbaijan is subsidizing Armenia's arms purchases. That's already a sign of just how crazy this situation has become and how complex, as Dick Hoagland said, it has become as well. Last year, as a result of the Azeri 
activities. Armenia came to Russia and obtained from Russia the Iskander missile in its presumably conventional form. The Iskander is a dual-use missile. It, has, it comes in conventional and nuclear capabilities. It's quite unlikely that Russia transferred a nuclear missile to Armenia. But the Iskander, as a, short, as a medium range or short range missile, it goes up to about 500 kilometers, according to its uh, paperwork, represents a huge escalation in this war and a threat not just to the armies on the uh, line of control, but to civilian counter value targets in Azerbaijan. And what's more, the Armenian government, led by President Sargsyan, has made a lot of statements which are in the press. You can find them quite easily, basically saying that we're prepared to go preemptively or to strike at Azerbaijan's civilian and infrastructural uh, targets. This, in turn, has prompted Azerbaijan to look abroad <coughs> for missile defenses. They haven't gotten them yet, but they're looking. So what we have here now is the classic action-reaction syndrome that McNamara talked about 50 years ago in the Cold War, but it's now being replayed at the local level, and the escalation in terms of quantity and quality of weapons. What's more, it is deliberately being encouraged by Russia, not only because it makes money, but because it gets influence. It now has the base at Gyumri for years to come. It has built up the base at Gyumri as well as other bases in the Caucasus, not just to be able to assert its power, but basically to sequester the Caucasus from NATO. So the other day, the president of Georgia was in town. President Trump said he supported Georgia's uh, goals and policies and so forth. It really doesn't matter if we support Georgia politically if we can't do anything for it militarily. And the Russians are trying to make that a certainty. They are also using the Caucasus to project power into Syria to threaten Turkey and to create uh, what professionals call an anti-axis uh, area denial, A2AD, bubble around the Black Sea and around Russia and the Caucasus to deter NATO from any influence, and then use that bubble to project further outward to encroach upon NATO positions in the Mediterranean. At the same time, this war makes it impossible for Turkey and Armenia to have a reconciliation, which is in the interests of both states. At one point, 15 percent of Armenia's GDP was lost because of the Turkish blockade. Opening up this war, uh, war and resolving it op opens up opportunities for Armenia to regain its sovereignty and its economic capability and potential, because then the blockade can be lifted, as there will be no justification for it. As long as the war continues, the blockade continues, suffering continues, and the prospects for reconciliation go a glimmering only to the benefit of Moscow, neither to the benefit of Ankara nor to the benefit of Yerevan. Indeed, Yerevan is paying a very severe price because it has basically mortgaged its sovereignty to Russia, as we saw in 2013, in order to get Russian support in Nagorno-Karabakh. That said, we know Russia is not going to be doing very much of anything to resolve this conflict. If we want to see a resolution, we cannot have the attitude that it's simply up to the other side and that it's very difficult to lead uh, the donkey to drink, as, as Swante quoted, a French diplomat. I would suggest to you that the United States has been strategically AWOL, as I, or missing in action, as I say in the book, with regard to this conflict during the Obama administration. Most of the Obama administration's concern after the abortive effort to have an Armeno-Turkish reconciliation, which failed because they didn't take into account this issue, has been on berating Azerbaijan for human rights. Now, Azerbaijan's human rights record is terrible. There's no denying it. But you're not going to get Azerbaijan to change that record if you don't engage Azerbaijan on the issue of its security, which is most critical to the Azeri government, because then they have no reason to listen to the United States. And we can see in Azeri foreign policy that they have moved quite a distance from the US during the Obama administration into a more neutral, non-aligned position even though they do not want to be part of the European uh, Eurosec, the Russian uh, economic program, and they do not want to end up as Armenia has. Nonetheless, there is pressure upon them from Moscow to join Eurosec. There are people in Moscow and in Baku who would like very much to try to emulate Vladimir Putin's style of government because they think that being in the West offers no benefits. And if they do that, then the Caucasus will be lost to the West and Turkey will come under greater pressure as will Europe, because there will also be the spillover 
into the whole energy dimension, which we have not mentioned, but which is critical for southeastern Europe as well. It is therefore of the highest strategic importance for the United States to understand that Western interests today, as in the 1990s, are bound up with the effort to bring about a resolution of this conflict. Colin Powell tried. He failed. But that's no reason why the Trump administration and Secretary Tillerson should not come up with a well-crafted initiative <coughs> that seeks to regenerate the talks and push both sides along with the offer of what diplomats call side payments to both sides in order to help them overcome the internal obstacles to peace. Because as Svante has said, and as I've believed all these years, the longer this goes on, the more likely it is there will be an explosion. And given the arms race that we now see and the entanglement of the great powers, when that explosion comes, it will not be confined to Armenia and Azerbaijan. And having you know, played this game out, so to speak, I can tell you that the outcomes are not good for anyone except Moscow. And I don't think either Yerevan or Baku, let alone Washington, benefits from that. Thank you. OK. I'll, the, the original plan for this event was to have me talk with the panel for the next 15 or 20, even 25 minutes. But we have some very high-priced talent in the audience, people who have been <laughs> negotiators on this issue, people who have been ambassadors in the Caucasus. I'm going to just ask a couple of questions, and I'll open it up to the floor uh, so we can pull in that, that high-priced talent. But uh, I'll start with a couple of questions. Um, Steve, among the various provocative things you've said, uh, you talked about America being AWOL on this under Obama. Now, was it just under Obama, or does it predate Obama, America being AWOL? Uh, uh, yeah, quick yes or no there will lead to a second question right away. It predates Obama. All right. Well, the more, the more important question is this. The way you described it, it seemed being AWOL was not so much related to our participation in the negotiations on NK, but more about our appreciation or failure to appreciate the importance of Azerbaijan. Could you elaborate? I think if you want to resolve this conflict, you have to understand the parties you're dealing with and why this region is important. Because there are so many claims on the attention and time of the president, secretary of state, NSC director, whoever they are, whatever administration you're discussing. Uh, it's always important for an administration to set priorities. That's essential. Caucasus and even more Central Asia have always come in since the Colin Powell effort in 2001, have always come in last behind other uh, priorities. Now, I'm not denying the importance of Europe, Northeast Asia, Middle East, Russian and Chinese relations. That's clear to everybody in this audience. But what I'm saying is that a failure to appreciate the strategic importance of these actors, in particular, the conflict here leads to a policy that provides opportunities for Russia to encroach upon Western interests and preserves the state of war and all the humanitarian, economic, and strategic uh, negativities that come out of that continuation of the state of war. And I would argue that the key player here for the United States is Azerbaijan, because Azerbaijan is a state that, for all the problems they have with human rights, wants to look west. It has a western-looking culture. It's an unusual Muslim state. It's basically... A, secular, tolerant society. It's a Shiite but Turkified Muslim kingdom, state. And it is therefore pro-Western with regard to the question of terrorism. Second, the energy issue, as everybody knows, I don't have to go into detail about that, is also critical to the independence of a lot of European states, not just to Azerbaijan, and to the broader issue of getting gas out of the Caspian which we've talked about in other four in this building. So to me, that's why it's, it's of the utmost importance. I look at this in strategic terms, and I see the failure to understand the strategic importance of the Caucasus as leading to a neglect of this issue with bad outcomes. OK, thank you. I'm going to ask just two more questions before I open it up. Um, Brenda, uh, Iran. Certainly the Iranian issue, not related to the Caucasus, has been one of the hottest in Washington over the last several years. How has the nuclear deal and the opening of relations between the West and Iran influenced uh, the 
the NK issue and more broadly security in the Caucasus? Yeah, and I think that's a really important question. I mean, the Obama administration's policy towards Iran was it's all about the nuclear deal and um, no constraints on Iran's uh, regional role. And in fact, even some encouragement for Iran to have you know a, a wider regional role in the in, you know in the, in the Middle East. Um, certainly, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, it was clear that the Obama administration w wanted you know more room for Iran in in, in all of these issues. And so. Uh, while it wasn't always explicit, um, it gave that same free, free reign um, for Iran and its northern border in, in, in the Caucasus and, and, in, and also towards uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and in other uh, directions. And so um, uh, you, you really see this in, you know, after, after the deal where Iran is much more uh, prominent in, in the region itself. Um, and I think now with the, with the sort of a big switch with the Trump administration where it's all about the regional role and not about the nuclear, nuclear program, I, I think that this is a big, we will see a shift in Iran's behavior in the region. But I think what's really important, and I, I wish I could share Steve's optimism for even if, that if, if there was a shift in US policy that this conflict could be resolved, I think that it's, it's actually getting more, um, if it used to be or, or someone could make the argument that the main actors were uh, Baku and Yerevan and was about preparing their people for peace or uh, uh, make, you know, taking decisions within their own societies. I think the same kind of internationalization that we've had, for instance, in Syria, where Syria now, for instance, isn't about different sects and different communities in Syria. It's also about Russia and Iran and, and uh, uh, Turkey, and to a certain extent, and it, which is also sad, but to a certain extent, also the US, uh, Israel, and maybe to a certain extent, Qatar. Um, and if, if at least Russia, Iran, and Turkey don't agree about the conflict, you know, about its resolution in Syria, you're not going to have a resolution. Well, I think we have a very similar situation in, in between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Baku and Yerevan could agree all they want about what the lines, of the, what the solution looks like. And if, if Russia, Iran, and Turkey, and, and to a certain extent the United States, um, don't, you know, don't find that in their interest, it, it, it's, it's not going to happen. And we, we've seen this a number of times. Each time we have you know, the, the negotiators, uh, Joe Pressel's in the, in the room from the, from the 90s that, that, that you know, was, was, was uh, you, know, you could make the sides actually reach the agreement three to four, you could even claim four times, and each time those, those agreements were uh, derailed by outside, outside forces. So, but if maybe in the 90s it was enough that the two, the two sides could even make an agreement, I think today we're not in that situation where uh, there's even any, any, uh, uh, any illusion that it's, it's, it's in the hands of the two, you know, the, the two sides. I think really important moving forward, if there's any chance with the US leading some sort of resolution effort, it's very important not to compartmentalize Russians' policies abroad. And we, we hear this explicitly from US officials. John Kerry used to say when they were working with you know, Russia on Syria, well, well, Ukraine is different. That's a different policy. Well, nice for you, Secretary Kerry, <laughs> but the Russians don't see it that way. It was, it's always was one policy, and I think it was a very clever from Moscow's side that you don't necessarily engage in a, a, an arena where you have a disadvantage, you would engage your rival in, a, in, a, in a, an arena where you have an advantage. So if, if the US wants to play a meaningful role in resolving Karabakh, it has to see it connected to Ukraine, to Iran, to Syria, with, with its, its overall bilateral relations uh, with, Mo with Moscow. And, and, the, and the same with, with Iran, as, I, Iran as well. Uh, uh, I, I, for, for Iran, for instance, this isn't about looking at history or looking at you know culture or anything like that it's just as much for instance a sort of low intensity conflict not all out war because there's a danger of spillover into the into their own country but for instance the conflict creates a, 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 a physical barrier between Turkey and, 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 and Azerbaijan, or Turkey and the rest of the Caucasus and Central Asia. That's in an, in an Iranian interest. And like, as we said before, with the whole ethnic stirring inside Iran, um, keeping Azerbaijan in a state of, of war also prevents it from being attractive, let's say, to its own Azerbaijani minority. My last question. Uh, Svante, you, and for that matter, Steve, also, and also Brenda, uh, spoke about how the relatively restrained, confined conflict in the Caucasus could explode with international implications. We might elaborate on that. Well, sure. I mean, there are, Steve has participated in war games on this, and many people in the room may have too. 
Uh, but I mean, it's very easy to, for example, just in the past few weeks, there have been pretty sizable military exercises between Turkey and Azerbaijan. Uh, that relationship has not reached the level of, you know, strategic alliance of the Russian uh, relationship with Armenia. But nevertheless, you're seeing how there is a very strong uh, Turkish-Azerbaijani uh, military relationship in which Georgia is also, to some extent, a, a part. Uh, so one thing, obviously, is if there, if there is a large-scale resumption of conflict, we've seen, for example, that in April uh, of last year, for the first time, the Turkish reaction was not one of ta talking about, you know, uh, reducing tensions and urging everybody to peace, but it was a full-scale siding with Azerbaijan to an extent we've never even seen in the Azalor years. Uh, obviously, that means that the risk of, a, um, of the involvement uh, on opposing sides, much as in Syria, uh, either by proxy or more directly by the surrounding powers is very real. Um, militarily, uh, obviously, a resumption of large-scale hostilities that doesn't stay limited to the conflict zone uh, would, would involve potentially large-scale refugee flows. Last time, it went into Iran. Which way that would go today, we don't know. But that would also prompt the reaction by the powers that are directly affected by it. So I think there are n n numerous scenarios in which you see the uh, large-scale resumption of conflict leading to the very rapid escalation of the involvement of outside parties. Okay. Steve, do I comment on that? Yes. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. 1993, when we had some of the early fighting, uh, the Azeri army was routed. It was a coup in Baku, even. The government fell. The Turkish army threatened to intervene. At that point, General Shaposhnikov, Yeltsin's military advisor, got up and said, if Turkey intervenes in Nagorno-Karabakh, it's World War III. In other words, that was a nuclear threat. If a war breaks out today and Armenia is in danger of losing, I have no doubt that Russia will intervene militarily to th or threaten to do so to check Azerbaijan. If that happens, then Azerbaijan's effective sovereignty de facto will have been compromised. And with that, its ability to be pro-Western and to send energy through Turkey to the West will also be adversely affected with repercussions throughout Eastern Europe. Furthermore, Georgia will come under immense pressure because it will then be surrounded by Russia. And its ability to get oil and gas from Azerbaijan, essentially at discounted prices, will also be compromised. And since Mr. Ivanishvili has been maneuvering all along to get gas from Gazprom. Uh, Russia will have an, a major entry path into Georgia that it has lacked for the last several years. That's only in the region. We can also see that th Russia will then have a complete military control over the Caucasus and use that to project power into the Middle East, as it has done in the Syria conflict already, uh, where they shot uh, cruise missiles from a Caspian Sea uh, frigate in 20, uh, for Putin's birthday two years ago, <laughs> just to show that they could do it. But once they have those capabilities, Turkey's ability to play any role whatsoever in NATO comes under tremendous pressure. And with that, of course, the NATO alliance's ability to do anything either in the Black Sea or in the Mediterranean also is reduced. So there are important ramifications of any kind of further conflict in the area. And that's only a few of them. Could I just add that a, any major resumption of hostilities that involves a Russian in intervention would immediately lead to the question of Russian transit rights across Georgia to its bases in Armenia, uh, and which could be used very easily to compromise for once and for all the sovereignty of Georgia. So you, again, you have many scenarios that you can play out. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rich Kozlich. Rich Take your Kozlich, next <laughs> Microphone. Professor, so that makes me not high-paid talent. And, and, and former ambassador to Azerbaijan. That's right. Um, this really deserves a, a broader um, rebuttal, I think, but I'm going to limit my comments to uh, two points. Um, somehow the assumption that there was a, a golden period when the United <laughs> States was uh, totally in tune with the strategic reality that I think has been incorrectly portrayed here, is just isn't a fact. <laughs> the good old days were old, but not necessarily good. Um, second, uh, I'm still waiting to hear from the panel specifically what the US government should do differently than it's doing now. Um, I think 
think uh, I disagree strongly with, with Brenda about who's playing the key role here. It is Baku and Yerevan. And they're the ones who hold the keys to settling, settling this conflict. But my question really is, okay, I get it that you think the U.S. has screwed up, certainly the last administration, if not before, but what, what do you ask us to do about it? Invite the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan to the White House? Oh, wait. <laughs> that happened last year, and there was a war. Um, you know, send our negotiator, you know, five times uh, a, a year to, to Baku and Yerevan and Stepanakarik as opposed to three. Um, I, I just don't understand. What do you want the U.S. to do that it's not doing now? By the way, I've got some ideas on that, but that's for another time. <laughs> we'll take first crack at this. Okay, well, apart from your own ideas, Rich, um, I don't think that there was a golden period when the United States and the, the region were in tune. But as you well know, because you were serving then, in the 90s, there was much more engagement. Well, how did the Baku pipeline, uh, Chehan pipeline come about, if not through Clinton's personal engagement? Poor, poor Dick Morningstar, it's flying all the time. Right. right. <laughs> well, I, 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 somehow, I, I, with all due respect, I don't think ambassadors make the policy on their own. Uh, I think you know, they, they execute the policy. Uh, and it's very clear that President Clinton was interested in this region, at least for the energy aspect. And if you start thinking about the energy, then at some point in time, if you're an intelligent human being, and Clinton certainly is, uh, the, the NK issue comes up. What would I have the United States do? I don't know what your ideas are, but this is what I would do. First of all, you have to have a really prepared initiative, uh, initiative detailed initiative that addresses the points that have been agreed to by both sides and the problems that are still outstanding. And I would bring the two presidents to the United States on the basis of that well-prepared initiative, assuming they want to come, and get them to negotiate without the media, like Camp David, and with the United States proviso that we will help fund issues that need to be solved. For example, just as in Camp David, as you know, we made a lot of, quote, side payments to both sides in order to get that deal across. Here, the question of refugees. There are several hundred thousand refugees, uh, mainly Azeri refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh. They want to go back to their homeland, or at least allegedly they want to go back. It's not likely, I think, in a final solution that's going to come about, but some provision needs to be made for their situation. Rebuilding the infrastructure uh, uh, in the, uh, the war zones is another way that both sides can be uh, compensated. Third, leaning on Turkey to lift the blockade of Armenia so that Armenia has economic opportunities outside of Russia. There are others, but in the interest of time, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Anyone else want to comment? Yeah. yeah. Okay, please. Well, I think the first time, call it whatever you want, if you want to call it the golden age or not, but the, the, the difference is that under the Clinton administration, there was a coordinated U.S. policy where the deputies committee was on a regular basis discussing issues relevant to the Caspian and the Caucasus, which meant that you had a, an involvement of not only one or two government agencies, but several at once. And you can shake your head, but I mean, this is very well, this is well, very well established that there was a policy that was set at the highest level of the U.S. government and where the different agencies of the U.S. government were all playing their role. That hasn't been the case since then. Now, about what to do, uh, I think I already mentioned in the last portion of my remarks, there is, you can't just burst into the room and say, I'm going to solve Nagorno-Karabakh immediately. What is required is an investment of energy, time, and commitment into the security affairs of the Caucasus so that the two parties, which have become very skeptical about the credibility of the United States, once again feel that the U.S. is a credible partner that is there to stay. Once you have that, I think you will see the situation change. By the way, uh, for this to come about, it also means what the U.S. does in Northeast Asia, what the U.S. does in Syria, what the U.S. does in Eastern Europe, all of these things matter and will change how the U.S. is perceived by these two parties. High-level representatives of the conflicting parties have said, at least in private, that the U.S. is no longer relevant to the security affairs of the Caucasus. That was not the case in the 1990s. That was not the case in the early 2000s. Today, the, the parties see the U.S. as being irrelevant to their security concerns. 
You have to change that. Once you've changed that, the ability for the U.S. to play a leading role in bringing about a resolution will be completely different. I think the question, you could ask the same question, you know, how does, how does the U.S. bring to a resolution of the conflict in Syria? How does the U.S. Uh, make sure that Iran uh, maintains its international commitments on the nuclear program and has a, a, a more positive regional role? The answer is not in this specific conflict, but recalculating completely Moscow, Washington relations. If we ask those questions, how do we work on solving the, the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh? We don't see the wider context of U.S.-Russian relations. We're not, I don't think we're going to make any progress. That's been the problem. We, again, we can't compartmentalize Russia's policies in each, each arena and think somehow in one place we're going to have Russia act in a certain way and in, in, a, different, in a, certain, a different arena they're going to act in a, dir a, a different way. So, of course, if it's just about this, it, it, it's sort of, I think it looks, it's almost like a mouse, you know, looking for cheese, right? And, and we don't see the whole thing that's going around around the mouse, right? He see, he sees this this little this little maze, right? To think that that any sort of bilateral interactions there are going to be out of the context of, of Russian U.S. relations, um, I, I think that's the the, the error. And, and and also just just the word, just in terms of precision, in terms of the word the blockade that's been used here. Turkey has a closed border with Armenia, but it doesn't. It's a legal definition of blockade. Blockade is when you actively uh, don't allow transport and in, 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 into a country. I know myself, I've flown on Armenian airlines over Turkish airspace. So I, I don't think that's the case that it's actual blockade, but it's a closed uh, border. It's an embargo. OK. Um, we have others who want to ask questions. But Rich, if you, have, if you want to respond with 60 seconds. Thank you. Um, Dick Morningstar. Well, Please identify your, your connection to this region. For, <laughs> are you now? Happy? I guess I did have something to do with the Baku Jehan pipeline and, <laughs> and executing. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, also, I'm now at the Atlantic Council running the Global Energy Center, so energy issues are key here. And I was ambassador to Azerbaijan from 2012 to 2014. And I have to say, I, as pessimistic as I usually am on the Gornikar <laughs> Bak, I'm even more so after listening uh, to the conversation today, and I agree with an awful lot of what has been, what has been said. Uh, with all due deference to my good friend, Ambassador Hoagland, uh, what you <laughs> talked about, uh, in fact, we were just saying uh, earlier, could have been the same words five years ago, uh, and, <laughs> or 10, or maybe longer. Uh, but the, I, I think we keep saying that Russia wants to cooperate with us as part of the Minsk group. I don't believe that. Uh, I think that they have, uh, uh, at times, you know, I think they want to contain the situation. They may not be looking, you know, they may be helping to keep things from an all-out, uh, from an all-out war. Uh, but uh, it seems to me, apart from the fact that neither country has any, uh, Azerbaijan or Armenia seems to have the political will uh, to solve the problem, that it's, I just don't see looking at it from Russia's self-interest and how they view their self-interest, why they would, how or why they would have any interest uh, in ultimately creating a, uh, a peaceful, uh, a peace uh, between, uh, between the two countries. They're maintaining maximum leverage uh, over, both, uh, over both countries uh, by the conflict, uh, uh, conflict continuing, uh, and a peaceful resolution will give the United States and the West even much, much more opportunity uh, to have a role in the Caucasus, which they have absolutely no interest. And if one were even, one could even become more cynical and say that although I think they don't really want to have a large-scale conflict, if there were a large-scale conflict, I think some of the consequences that you talked about could take place, like it would give the perfect, expe perfect excuse for Russia to to march back into uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. So having said all that, and I was going to ask Rich's question as to, well, what do we really do? Uh, <clears throat> I think your suggestions are reasonable suggestions, but it won't happen, uh, uh, or at least there will be no success without uh, the political will in Baku and Yerevan, as well as Russia uh, being willing uh, to allow uh, a settlement to take place. So I think I come back, and it's, there is a question, believe it or not, 
I come back to, to Brenda's comment and ask, okay, we need to do a bunch of things. There are uh, political issues within the United States as to how far we go uh, with respect to certain, uh, you know, certain steps we might take. Uh, but at the end of the day, looking at the whole global context, how might we obtain, attain some leverage over Moscow that might, in fact, lead to a solution? Because without that leverage, and this is, this is a question, how ca can we, uh, and is this ultimately the only way that there would be a resolution? Sorry for taking no, so good. long. No, 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 we, 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 want, we wanted you to give your expertise. Jake, you want to jump in? Uh, just very briefly, I, I, I want to make clear that when I say that the U.S. works well with Russia in the Minsk group process, uh, I'm talking on day-to-day -day work. I don't see real strong opposition of views in the work that we do. Um, I've gotten to know my co-chairs, Ambassador Visconti from France, Ambassador Popov from Russia, and uh, Igor Popov and I work together very well. We, we don't disagree when we sit down behind closed doors on talking points that we develop for the presidents, for example, or for the foreign ministers. So I just wanted to make that slight clarification there. I'm not saying that our interests coincide, but on a specific issue like this, we can work together successfully. The other thing I wanted to throw out here, and I, I, I would love to answer many of these and jump into the conversation, but as the serving official right now, I shouldn't do that. However, there is one term that I think we need to throw into this, and that's something that we've heard since 2001, uh, Putin's first term, and that is uh, Moscow's insistence on Russia's <laughs> sphere of influence, which it sometimes uses the term exclusive sphere of influence. So I, I think that has to be factored into the conversation also. Does anyone on the panel want to address um, Nick's question? Okay. Steve is Svante. But please, okay. short. Okay. I think, like Svante said, you have to change the environment in which Baku and Yerevan are calculating the situation. It may well be the case, and I think it probably is, that they have been unwilling to make movements to facilitate the solution for whatever reason. But if they, one of those, I'm sure, is because they do think that the United States in the last several years has retreated from the region. Uh, I mean, Svante confirms that I've written about it, and I think it, it's fairly clear. To the extent that the United States develops a genuine strategy with regard to Russia to gain leverage and assigns priorities to certain issues. It may not be Nagorno-Karabakh, because there's a great deal out there that may well be more important, Ukraine, Syria, arms control, whatever. You know, we can argue about that. But to the extent that there is leverage and a strategy to execute that leverage and to increase it, then you might be able to get progress on this. And then you might be able to affect the calculus in Yerevan and Baku, because they will then see, as Fante has said, that the United States is truly engaged credible, and a partner for the long term. Otherwise, we will, we will relapse into the inertial condition. Okay. So yeah, I think it's really important that um, when Russia articulates its interest in different regions, we have a pragmatic approach to Russia's role or potential role, and not automatically, okay, let's block Russia, it's bad. I think, you know, we have to learn lessons from, you know, 2010 in Syria, when, when Russia articulated they were willing to pull out the chemical weapons, they, they had interest there, they had a presence there, um, but the only thing was that they, they were going to support the continuation of, of Assad or Assad family representative in government. The U.S. poo-pooed them and, you know, and marginalized them, when probably if we would have accepted the Russian role then, we, would, we could have averted the type of, you know, the, the extent of the civil war uh, in Syria, but our automatic instinct was push you know, Russia out. So when you think, I don't know, with Russia now, for instance, now having a growing role in Libya, 
I don't know to say is that good or is that bad, but it's something that should be addressed in Washington. What you know, is this is this automatically a bad thing or is it something that can uh, be helpful? Even things on the symbolic level. We had uh, Vic Victory Day celebrated in Moscow this year. Western Press, Washington Washington Post, very excited. No Western representatives there. Well, I think that's really silly. I think there should have been Western government celebrating the fact that, that yes, the West and the Soviet Union did defeat evil and create out the post-World War II you know, strategic architect in the world. And why couldn't you have something that's so uh, uh, not very not big concession to have uh, Western representatives there celebrating actually periods of cooperation. So even things that are not very costly, uh, we don't make those, you know, those kind of gestures. And I think also we need to recalculate how in, in the Washington consensus, how you view relations with Moscow, because anytime there's any sort of uh, support for uh, a more pragmatic, more practical relations with Moscow, what you get is, oh, you, you, know, you like Putin, you like the regime, you're buddy-buddy. No, it's actually recognizing that this, you, there, you, there are rivals, and sometimes you have to recognize the presence of your rival uh, and, and its interests and figure out how to mitigate uh, uh, the issues of conflict. Jump Just two quick points. Uh, the first is about political will. So one question is, why is there no political will? Well, some of these things are related to domestic political calculations. Uh, some may be related to the fact that it's safer for regime security purposes not to engage in negotiations that are where you have to give away something than not to do so. Uh, but I think there is also another factor, which is that in this, you know, if you look at what happened from 1992, for, let's say to 2008, not so much in the region. It was a fairly, you know, people knew where everybody was, so to speak. After 2008, you have one thing after the other, from the from the Georgia war to the um, to the Turkish Armenian Obama supported rapprochement to the Arab Spring to the Ur Iranian nuclear deal to Crimea to Syria. All of these things that have shaken up all the geopolitics of the re region, making it very unstable. And, and making the countries very vulnerable to what's going on around them. In that situation, why would there be a political will to engage in difficult negotiations in this area of instability? Which brings me to the second point, which is this is not really about conflict resolution at this point. We're talking about preventing a major war. Hmm. And we're talking about countries that are surrounding these regions that may not have an interest, as we do, in preventing a major war. Some may want a small war, and we'll end up with a bigger war uh, that maybe will be detrimental to our interests. We keep thinking, oh, Russia doesn't want a war. Russia doesn't want trouble in the Caucasus. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. We, it's not in our interest to have a major escalation to a major war after 1965, again, India, Pakistan, or 1967-73 war in the Middle East. That's what it's about at this point. Now, if you, and then you engage in order to prevent war, that provides you, together with a broader American security re-engagement of the broader, uh, of the broader region with a position to some point in the future, things might change in Russia, for example, to effectuate a solution when the time is right. But we don't even have the leverage at this point so that if Putin tomorrow disappears and Russia magically changes, we don't have the leverage to at this point go into the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict and impose ourselves as a credible mediator. Thank you. Okay, Bob Racky. Just even to propose, not let, not impose. Thank you. I'm Bob Bradkey. I was the United States co-chair from September 2009 to uh, the end of 2012, January 2013. There are a lot of things I could say, uh, and I'll try to you know, not uh, go too deeply into the past. Let me start out with a point of agreement, which is that the situation is very serious. But I see the fact that there has not been a renewed full-scale conflict, not so much as the failure of our policy, but is actually a success. Our policies had two goals in this entire period get a solution, make sure there's no full-scale war. Mm. So I'm not prepared to accept the fact that there's somehow a, 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 a failure here. Yes. I think, at least in part, our policy's been successful. I want to come back on the point about being AWOL in the, in the uh, Obama administration. I, I can only say from my perspective that that doesn't match the reality that I saw from 2009 to the end of 2012. I had, uh, sometimes with the co-chairs, sometimes separately, sometimes with other US officials, 30 meetings with the two presidents. I made 12 trips to Karabakh. Uh, Secretary Clinton, in my time, visited the region. She met with the president, in, uh, President of Armenia in, in Munich. President Obama met with both presidents. President Obama engaged on the phone. I had Mrs. Clinton tell me, anytime you need my help, 
let me know. A anytime I needed her help, she was always there to help. Uh, so again, I, I just I find it hard to accept that, that we were AWOL in this period when, in fact, we were very much engaged in the run-up to Kazan, which was a very close thing. It was almost a success. But the reason it failed again was not because the international context wasn't right. This was a period where the US, Russia, the Europeans were all working very closely together. Uh, and <coughs> it was a failure of political will by the parties. That is just a fact. Mm -hmm. And ag again, I you know, would like to end with a question, but I have the same question Rich Kaslovich had. What are we supposed to do? The issue of side payments, the issue for Azerbaijan was never money for, to return, and they're not refugees, they're IDPs, because they've come, they're, 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 they're settled in other parts of Azerbaijan. Uh, the Azerbaijanis, Aliyev would always tell us, we'll, we'll get these reconstructed, we have the money to get these areas done. They're not, I don't think they were looking for that kind of, of, of leverage, so to speak. That's, that's uh, I don't think there's something we can do there that is that significant. Again, it comes down, and you say, why is there fair political will? Because this is a fundamental clash of principles. It's self-determination. The people of Karabakh have the right to decide their future versus the principle of territorial integrity. Mm -hmm. These are two deeply rooted, mm -hmm. fundamental principles that are deeply held by both sides. Finding a way to square that circle is not an easy mm -hmm. matter. It requires a lot of compromise by the parties and willingness to accept each other's perspective. So it's not just a, political will is very fundamental and important. Okay, uh, to keep things moving, Steve, you can respond to this. Obviously, uh, so being picked up on your point, then we'll go on to the next question. Well, I, I, I take your point regarding the first Obama's term, but I suspect in the second term that there was a lot less interest. I, I was there during the second term. Yeah. Okay. It, just, it <laughs> never seemed to come up, and uh, I I remember listening to Ambassador Warlick, who succeeded you, uh, saying that the problem was political will, and then uh, but and that we agreeing with the Russians and that they're working cooperatively with us, and at the same time as the Russians were going around selling arms to Az to Armenia and Azerbaijan, and we are berating Azerbaijan in the press for the human rights violations, which are severe, and so on. So uh, I think that there was no coherent policy, at least certainly in the second term, and that contributed to the failure. The fact that there's a, an absence of political will, I think, has been established long before we had this meeting today. And that goes back years. Uh, I listened to a program yesterday with Wayne Merry, who knows this issue very well, uh, former US diplomat. And he pointed out as well that the problem is today not that the US hasn't invested resources, but that the local governments are unwilling to make the effort at this time. But if that's the case, then it's necessary for us to rethink the calculus in which they're operating if we think this is an important issue. If we think this is an important issue, and apparently, as from what you're saying, the Secretary Clinton and President Obama during her time in office and his thought it was, then we need to change the calculus of the decision makers by reorganizing or the way in which this issue is approached so that th the conditions that gave rise to a lack of will will change. And with that, perhaps their behavior will change. OK, and thank you. Um, Joe Pressel. My name is Joe Pressel, and I'm yet another of the dreary group of Minsk Group co-chairmen. <laughs> uh, I want to make a couple of comments and, and, and one suggestion. First of all, um, when Dick Morningstar said that he could have made uh, Dick Hoagland's speech five years ago, I, I came very close to making that speech almost 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that, it's very depressing that we're still making, we are still obliged to make the same speech. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is to say that all of you people on the panel, with the exception of Dick Hoagland, are, are very good at complaining about the United States and our lack of policy and our fecklessness and so on. Well, that's true, and it's all good, clean fun. And one of the reasons you complain about the Americans is because you've got a fighting chance of getting the Americans to make a change, whereas doing this to the Russians doesn't produce much. So I, I accept why you're doing it, uh, but it's not necessarily a good prescription actually to get the Americans to do things. Uh, my specific suggestion I addressed to Dick Hoagland, um, and that is, 
since we have a new French president and a new uh, situation in Europe, would it not be worthwhile to use Monsieur Macron's election as a way to try to get the Europeans to take rather more interest and involvement uh, in this thing than they have in the past? I, I realize the difficulty with that is that most European statesmen, uh, when they become statesmen, uh, seem to go into a hospital and have an operation as a result of which they tend to sing only in soprano, but um, that's, that's, that's the problem we're always going to have. But it, it gives you at least an excuse uh, to try to get the Europeans more involved. And I think they're probably now sufficiently irritated by the Russians that they might actually uh, come up with some reasonable ideas. They could scarcely fail to do a, a worse job than, than we have, trying as hard as, as we could. Um, I'm sorry, I'm probably the most cynical man in this room. Please. Joe, I, I want to uh, just make a short comment on that, and thank you for that. Um, the, the French co-chair in this process, Ambassador Stéphane Visconti, has been on the job only since last October. So, so he is, if I'm the most junior interim partner right now, he's the second junior partner after the Russian who's been on for eight years. What I want to tell you is that France has been under his co-chairmanship has been much more active than they were in the past before him. Uh, there have been visits by both presidents to Paris before the election, foreign ministers. Uh, uh, Ambassador Visconti is very highly placed in his foreign affairs uh, apparatus in Paris. Uh, he's looking at possibly even a, a, a higher level job in the new administration that's coming in right now. But what I'm saying is that France has been really trying to move on this. Uh, and, and I think that should be welcome also. OK. Uh, next question right here. Thank you. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sylwia Szabowska from the uh, Polish Defense Attaché Office. A uh, few quick questions. One First question. Of all, Oh, okay. <laughs> One question is, what makes you sure that uh, Trump, President Trump administration will be willing at all to deal with uh, Nagorno-Karabakh? Yeah, and uh, taking into account the conflicting spheres of uh, interests within the administration as such. Okay. Um, anyone want to take this question? Okay, Steve, please. We have a lot of others. Please. Well, in a word, nothing. Uh, okay. And I am not convinced that th this administration has the capacity to, to act strategically. Uh, that remains to be seen. I mean, clearly they were engaged with Georgia, uh, for, as the visit uh, the other day showed. But I have yet to see that there's any interest in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, you know, our, my remarks, and I, I imagine uh, Svante's and Brenda's, are expressions of our interest in getting the Trump administration to see this question in a different light. But I have very little expectation that they will, because there are a number of really urgent issues out there, and to be frank, an impaired policy process. Without the appointments in the State Department or the Pentagon and the backbiting that you see in the media uh, inside the White House uh, about the Pentagon and the NSC, it's going to be very, and other reasons which I don't need to go into, it's going to be very difficult to get any kind of coherent strategic foreign policy out of this administration. Okay, thank you. Question over here. Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. My name is Raj Atash, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Armenian Embassy. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, uh, I'm a little bit disappointed nobody uh, among the panelists, except for Ambassador Hogland, mentioned the, uh, about the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, about the uh, right of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh to the self-determination. And in this Please regard... Speak into the microphone. Yes. In this regard, I just want to make a very short comment on the book that I had the chance to read a few days ago. You know, it misinterprets, uh, unfortunately, the, the nature of the conflict. The, the very title of the book, uh, The uh, uh, International Politics on Armenia-Azerbaijani Conflict. You know, uh, uh, such interpretation of the conflict reduces it to an interstate conflict between two nations, which rules out, completely rules out, the possibility for the people of Nagorno-Karabakh to express its will. Uh, 
you know, and it forgets to to mention that the book itself, that the people of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, resorted to to uh, uh, remedial secession as a result or in and in response to the Armenian massacres in Sumgait, in Baku, and other places throughout Azerbaijan, and in response to the policy of annihilation that which, uh, for example, happened in, in, in Nakhichevan, uh, an autonomous uh, 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 entity uh, which was uh, once populated by Armenians. And um, it also claimed that, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mention that three fundamental principles of international law, self-determination, territorial integrity, and, 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 and non-use of force lie at the foundation of the, uh, of the conflict, and nor did it mention that the final stage of the, uh, of the settlement, according to the Madrid principles, uh, is, the, is the referendum which proves, it said, it's itself proves that the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, there is a consensus among the both uh, mediators and the parties of the conflict that the people of Nagorno-Karabakh have the right to define its uh, final status through free, uh, free expression of, 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 of the will. You know, the irony of the situation, in my vision, is that uh, Azerbaijan as a member, as a part of the conflict, and as a part of the peace process, accepted these principles. And ipso facto, recognized the, uh, the right of the Nagorno-Karabakh, people of Nagorno-Karabakh, to the self-determination. But unfortunately, I have to note that this book doesn't speak about it, and this is my disappointment about the book. Thank, Thank you. you. Swante, you want to respond? Sure. Um, I don't think we have time to get into all the legal details, no, just, just but we can do that separately um, or, or at a later point. I think the, the key, th as you well know, and everything you said about the principles is absolutely correct. The only thing that there is nothing that says that the pr principle of self-determination is in principle in contradiction with the principle of territorial integrity because self-determination does not necessarily equal independence. Now, the, it may or it may not. That's another point. But the, the real point, let me respond about the title. Uh, as you will see, s certain of the authors use the term Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. These are actually used interchangeably within the, uh, within, in the text of the book. In the title, uh, I think the reason why, it's actually explained in one of the first pages why the, I refer to the, to the conflict as the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. It has nothing to do with whether or not a certain population has a right to whatever. It is because this conflict was never reduced to the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. It was in, already in late 1987 in southern Armenia. It was in Baku, as you yourself mentioned, where, all, where there are no longer Armenians, where there are very few, whereas there used to be a very large Armenian population. It uh, includes all these territories that are present day occupied, as well as territories, other territories of Armenia and Azerbaijan that have been involved in a conflict. So therefore, it was never only about Nagorno-Karabakh, and it was never restricted geographically to the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. And certainly, as the Minsk group itself, the two parties are Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, it, is between, it is primarily a conflict between these two parties. That doesn't mean that the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians, or for that matter, Nagorno-Karabakh Azerbaijanis, is irrelevant to the conflict. Far from it. Okay, thank you. Um, Tamori, please keep it quick. Fred is still. Okay, no, Fred's thank you. Uh, first, uh, little comment to Brenda. Quick. One Ukrainian journalist was asked why Russians cannot and what Americans can, and he gave a brilliant answer. He said, after Americans you have South Korea, after Russians you have North Korea. So engaging with Russia on those issues that they seemingly to being uh, nice guys is not really serious. Um, for me, it's very, I'm a very opinionated person when it comes to conflict. So for me, the resolution resolution is when something happens to Russia like it happened to Soviet Union, and there were many resolutions for many nations. So resolution will be there. Uh, that's why what Swante says that at this stage we're talking about averting war is the most relevant. So my question is, is the Minsk group the right format for that? Huh. And it probably there should be something different. And with is some that for other Ambassador Hovland? Do you want to no, <laughs> 
Student Health. Okay, anyone on the panel want to jump in on this? Sure, I mean, I think the, the issue of the Minsk Group is uh, there are two points. The first is, I think if we were going to remake the negotiating mechanism today, maybe it wouldn't look like the Minsk Group. In the political realities that we have, the chances that you are going to succeed in creating something else in the Minsk Group is highly limited. However, and a point that is made somewhere in the book, I hope, if I didn't forget it, uh, is that there are things that can be changed in the Minsk Group. For example, if President Macron is such a pro-European, maybe it is time to make the EU more of a uh, institutional actor in the Minsk Group because the EU is, is, is where the money for reconstruction and for uh, altering the issue of the opportunity no. cost of a lack <laughs> uh, of a resolution could be, a, could okay, be thank addressed. You. Um, Fred. As a uh, representing one of the co-sponsors along with Ambassador Herbst of this event, <clears throat> very happy that, that Joe and, and Dick and, and Rich and others who are real veterans of this are present and able to enlighten us. However, uh, uh, as a historian, that's nice. Uh, but. Uh, maybe we're just wallowing in the history. I worry that a good chess player doesn't wallow in the history of the game, uh, of the particular match. He walks up to the table and looks at it fresh and analyzes it and finds answers that perhaps the people who've been sitting at the table for hours don't see. And that's the side of this which it seems to me we have to focus on. And the virtue of this book is that it has not everyone, but many of the pieces in this book do exactly that, have a very sharp focus on the present, are not wallowing in the past. Look, it's happened, it's a mess, we all know that. They're all, it's a mess, but also it is all strewn with good intentions and competent people working hard, so we know that. But that's the past, and the, and the skill at this moment is to walk up to the table with fresh eyes, analyze it clearly, and come up with, a solu with solutions, alternative solutions, that will actually move the ball and not simply address some old hurt. Thank you. Oh, right here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bugar Gurbanov. I'm a counselor at the Azerbaijani Embassy. Thank you very much, Ambassador Herbs, uh, for uh, holding this excellent uh, briefing. And thank you to Ambassador Morningstar, to Ambassador Bratke, to Ambassador Kozulari John, <laughs> to the distinguished panel. <laughs> and it, it really shows the uh, history and background of the conflict, uh, that how things are uh, developing. <coughs> I, I wanted to touch upon a specific notion that it's up to parties to solve. I mean, Basically, if it were up to the parties, then we wouldn't need mediators. Uh, the, the, the fact that one country, in, in this case Armenia, occupies the territories of another country and ethnically clings to all the territories, and for these 25 years, there is no opportunity for broader population to return to their homes, I mean, including my, I mean, my bigger family. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something very uh, troubling. And you, uh, co chairs, Russia, France, and uh, United States, yes, <laughs> committed uh, to uh, facilitate resolving these issues on the principles, under the principles of Helsinki Final Act, including relevant resolutions of the, United, uh, of the Security Council, which uh, this is written in the uh, mandate of the co chairs. And from this perspective, of course, it's it's fair from Azerbaijan side, as a country who suffered, who lost territories, who lost people, to more active engagement by the co-chairs. And this brings me uh, to the notion that uh, co-chairs, and I unfortunately observe it on the side of the US, of the US co-chairs, they're gradually acquiescing to this current status quo. As Ambassador Bradke told, uh, I mean, as, as also mentioned previously, you know, there is a, uh, somehow this speech could be done five years ago, 10 years ago. So, and Ambassador Bratke saw about three principal fundamental contradiction. Helsinki Final Act, the principle eight, says that equal rights, self-determination of peoples, 
taking into account other principles and including those related to territorial integrity. So, and, and another point says that this principle should be interpreted in light of the other. So there is no con uh, fundamental contradiction. And, uh, and my Armenian colleague said about people, uh, people of Nagorno Karabakh, uh, to tell the truth, I would expect much more constructive approach because this conflict is really blocking future development of the region. There is no people, there is a population of Nagorno Karabakh. There, there is Azerbaijani community, there is Armenian community. And now I come uh, to a specific question. Uh, I mean, former warlord in Karabakh, who happens now to be president of Armenia, who confessed in his interview to British journalist, Thomas de Voile, that actual Armenians conducted ethnic cleansing and Armenians massacred Khojali, can he be a credible negotiating partner? I mean, who did this? And he did it for a purpose, and he elevated uh, Nazi collaborator Najdeer as his national ideology. Can he be a credible partner in resolving this conflict? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Very quickly, the answer to this question reminds me of an old like Cold War Polish anecdote where a son asks his father, are the Russians our friends or our brothers? And the father replies, they're our brothers. You can choose your friends. Uh, you can't choose the head of state of other countries, and you have to negotiate with whoever the head of state is uh, in this situation. I mean, and raising this issue is just a, a dead end. It's not going to lead you to a more productive outcome. Whatever, whatever he did in the past, uh, Mr. Sargsyan is now the president of Armenia. He's that recognized as such, and you have to deal with him. And uh, it may not be pleasant, but it's necessary. Okay, thank you. We've already pa passed 11 o'clock. There are five questions to be asked. Uh, we really can't even do one. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank the panel for interesting discussion. Thank and I can tell you, we will do more on this subject, given the great interest. Thank you, thank you Dr. Blank.